You are listening to Mining Stock Education, where you'll learn from the top leaders in the natural resource sector and uncover quality mining investment opportunities. Thanks for tuning in to Mining Stock Education. I'm your host, Bill Powers. Well, in mining stock investing, there comes a time where as speculators, we get legal uncertainty plays to where you can bet on a legal outcome. So for example, an NGO, a non-government organization might protest a mine, that mine might shut down, the share price might crater, drop 60, 70%. And then you can assess that situation to see what the outcome may be. And you could speculate. And oftentimes, as you digest the, the legal information, information and the arguments from both sides, you probably have a higher probability of guessing the outcome than even speculating in a, in a virgin drill play because the odds, the, the geological odds against success, even for a good team, are low. And so when I was thinking this through, we're not going to be talking only about mining stocks today. It's going to relate to the broader investment themes of investing in all different types of uh, stocks and even creating investment opportunities for yourself. And to do this, to talk about these legal uncertainty plays, I'm bringing on the show again, my friend, Kerry Lutz. So Kerry, welcome back onto the show. You're an entrepreneur, you're an investor, and many people might not know that you're also a lawyer. So with that combination, I know a little bit of your story, you've been able to succeed, especially looking at these legal uncertainty plays. Could you share with my audience some of your success that you've had analyzing these situations? Yeah, well, so, there's two types of opportunities that arise in litigation plays. And there's actually hedge funds that specialize in these types of opportunities. They kind of fall into what used to be called special situations. We don't really use that term anymore in investing. I haven't heard it probably in 10 years because I think everything's turned into a special situation now. But so you have the case where you're company that you're interested in has prevailed in a large lawsuit and they're going to be receiving a recovery or substantial funds. It might even knock out a competitor. And from that, you're going to, you have an opportunity there, but you have to be able to ascertain whether or not a lawsuit is going to be affirmed by the appellate courts and if it's enough money eventually, whether the Supreme Court will take it or not. And I had a case like that a number of years ago, a company called TiVo, they invented DVRs, digital video recorders, and they had this feature called time shifting where you could record the, much like a a video cassette recorder, but on screen, much easier. You record a show and then you can watch it later. I mean, it seems something very basic. Everybody does it now. But 10, 12 years ago, the legal footing here was uncertain. Dish TV, which was a a competitor, I think it's still around. uh, It came out with its own version of a DVR that did time shifting. And uh, TiVo sued them. They sued them in uh, district court in Texas this place called the Rocket Docket. That's what that court was nicknamed. And they prevailed. And you could argue over the validity of their patents and all that. The fact is, in these patent cases, it's very unusual for the appellate court to upset it, to upset the verdict. And they got like a $350 million verdict. Uh, Dish Network was outraged. They tried to do a workaround on the patent they supposedly infringed. And TiVo went back to court and they got additional damages. I think they were up to 600 million by the time all was said and done. So awards are great, lawsuits are great, but TiVo's price didn't really reflect the bonanza that they were about to receive a, because uh, you don't know if the case is going to be upheld on appeal, and B, because uh, the timing of it, it could be years down the road, which it was a couple of years. Uh, at that time, I bought TiVo, it was trading like for next to nothing. And uh, I was even trying to get friends in uh, hedge funds to, uh, to take a look at the company because it was uh, so primely situated. But before I bought it, I reviewed the record of the case. You can do that online a lot of times. 
I had a friend, a close friend who was a patent attorney. I sent the decision off to him. And after a lot of study, you know, many, many hours of reading all the pleadings, came to the conclusion that the judge's decision was bulletproof. And from there, I bought the stock, bought a lot of it, and tripled my money in roughly 18 months. And it did eventually go to the Supreme Court. They couldn't win this case. If they had any chance of winning the appeal, Dish Network, they blew it when they tried to create a workaround on the patent and it further infringed because then it became willful. And the, the CEO of Dish Network had totally dug his feet in. He wasn't budging. He wasn't going to pay them a penny. I mean, this is a case that probably could have been settled for $10 million up front in the form of a license fee, but he just wouldn't do it because he said their patent wasn't real. So that's just one example. Then you've also got instances where a company is a defendant and a huge lawsuit is commenced against them and the market punishes their security. Uh, this one's a little bit more risky, but the one thing you have to know about the legal system is that very few cases actually ever go to court. Almost all of them, uh, we're talking in the high 97% or so, are settled at the doors, at the steps of the courthouse. So just because there's a big lawsuit and uh, the stock's taken a hit really doesn't mean anything. And if the stock was trading at or below a fair value before the lawsuit hit, you could really get some mileage out of this because you could be buying it well undervalued from where it should be trading. Now, there's a risk, and the risk is that your legal assessment could be wrong, in which case, how much lower is it going to go than you bought it already? The market's already discounted a successful lawsuit against the company or against the uh, or in favor of the other company. So, so there's two ways to play these games. Um, there are these patent trolling companies. They've been making billions off of patent infringement for years. Um, the courts have tried to rein them in a bit. But it's different than when there's a company actually using their patents in their own business. They didn't just buy it up and you know, have the equivalent of the computer patent two plus two equals four, uh, something very simple, and then go sue everybody who has a program that does it. Not so much. Uh, that's not really what we're talking about here. FPX Nickel is developing the large-scale Dakar Nickel District in central British Columbia. Within the district is FPX Nickel's PEA stage Baptiste Nickel Deposit, which is projected to be among the world's top 10 largest nickel mines by annual output. The Baptiste Deposit has the potential for the lowest quartile operating costs at just $2.74 per pound. And compared to recent global nickel mines, the project requires a low capex. FPX is also commencing its first ever drill program at its van target in the Dakar Nickel District. Surf Surface samples have indicated that the van target footprint is larger in scale and 10 to 15 percent higher in grade than Baptiste. FPX Nickel trades in Canada as FPX and on the OTC under FPOCF. To learn more, go to FPXNickel.com. That's FPXNickel.com. Okay, so Kerry, uh, do you agree with my premise that I laid out in the beginning that, because both you and I speculate in exploration stocks, we've had some nice successes, we've also lost money or been flat on a lot of our speculations here. As a speculator, which you are, would you think that legal uncertainty outcomes is one of the best speculations you can make? Because as you said, sometimes a, a loss is kind of factored into the share price. And then if you can study it, see that there's potential for them to win, the stock can pop three, fourfold quite quickly. Yeah, well, you have to be wary of these because uh, all that uh, glitters is not gold. Uh, sometimes uh, the lawsuit will be such that the outcome will wipe out the company one way or the other. And if that company is trading for next, next to nothing, that could be a good opportunity to get into it, but you have to try to make an assessment and you can find uh, there are newsletter writers. I don't know about them off the top of my head, but there are people that follow these situations and have profited quite handsomely. It's really what you would call legal arbitrage. So you're arbitraging the value because bad news, you know, when it first breaks, the market's a little weak. It can really devastate a company's stock and, and effectively be over discounted in the price. So 
you know, if there's a miner out there and there's some environmental entity suing them and it's in a pro mining state and it's really against the country's country's policy, like if it was, say, hypothetically a copper mine, probably might not even affect the company's stock price or it might hold it down vis-a-vis that of its peers. So it might not be trading at a discount. The stock might not have been hit, but all of its peers could be trading at many times its uh, prospective PE or ounces in the ground. So it can work definitely work for mining companies, but a note of caution because if you're in an area that's really environmentally sensitive, we saw we saw a place in Alaska where even the prior administration, which was very pro mining, shot down the project because they just said it's too environmentally damaging. And you know what happened to the company's stock, you know? So, uh, and you have to be able to, there's bad news and then there's devastating news. You know, bad news is the lawsuit got started. The devastating news is you have virtually no chance to win. You're dead in the water. So you have to be able to differentiate, but legal uncertainty in a company because the average investor is so incapable of accurately assessing it can really be a windfall to the savvy investor who takes the time out to study it. And you don't have to necessarily be a lawyer to to assess it. A lot of uh, lawyers publicly comment for free on existing lawsuits that are out there that are within their area of expertise. So, Kerry, you answered my question before I could ask it. So a lot of people are listening to us. They're like, OK, this is this is great, Bill. However, I'm not a lawyer, never read a law dictionary, couldn't even understand the case if I tried to understand it. So you're saying there's some resources out there that uh, investors, speculators can access to to come to their own conclusions. Yeah, like in the case of TiVo, I actually called up the attorney who was representing TiVo and I said to you know, we had a common friend and I, I had got an intro. I said, well, what's with the case? You're going to win this or not? And, you know, any lawyer you ask that to is going to say, well, you know, the legal system is very uncertain and blah, blah, blah. But when we finally got down to it, he was very confident. You know, if you can get an 80% confidence level that they're going to win, you need, sometimes it's important to look at the judge who's involved uh, for particular types of cases. And now it's so simple to to look up any judge's uh, string of decisions to get an idea of how he or she will decide a particular case. So, uh, yeah, you know, there, but there's always commentary about these cases because they make the news. You know, when a company's stock goes down a third in a day over a filing of a lawsuit, and it could be an antitrust suit. I love uh, suits... I remember when um, AT&T was under attack for uh, antitrust by the federal government. It seems like it seems like a lifetime ago, Bill, because now everything is a phone, you know, but nobody wants phones. But back then, AT&T controlled all the phone systems, the vast majority in the country. And that was a case where the uh, sum of the parts was really uh, much greater than the actual whole because different markets were better than others, like Southern Bell, Southwestern Bell, they were growing rapidly. And then you had like uh, New England Telephone Company, which was barely doing anything. Point was, once they split them up, if you had bought the, uh, the AT&T shares, you would have gotten six companies and you would have made many times your money if you held onto it. Plus you would have received a very healthy dividend that was rapidly increasing in a lot of these companies. So that's just one example of, a, you know, when the government brings a humongous lawsuit against a company like Microsoft, it depressed the shares for a long time. But in reality, nothing was going to happen because, you know, they agreed not to install their software or have these lockup agreements. But here we are. 25 years later, this is during the Clinton administration, Microsoft is still a behemoth. Granted, there are bigger companies and computers now like Facebook and Google and and Apple in certain respects is larger, uh, certainly by share market cap. 
you know, market capitalization. But if you bought Microsoft back then, uh, it has gone up many times now. Maybe you could do better. Let's wait to see when Amazon gets sued in an antitrust action. So, Kerry, we're looking at, uh, you know, some maybe unconventional or less looked at ways to make money here as we're talking about this. And one of the things of your story, as I came to know it and your career of investing in entrepreneurship that impressed me was that you essentially created investment opportunities to where you would learn the nitty gritty of how the legal system worked or ownership of certain assets worked. And then you would connect that opportunity that you discovered with money in New York, and in turn created a very nice passive income source for yourself. You know, share as much as you want, but also encourage my listeners to look for opportunities and go out there and find ways to make money. Yeah, well, my theory is, uh, no matter what, the opportunities are always around us and we, we pick and choose them. And uh, we were doing deals with uh, buying distressed debt in various uh, markets. And, and then servicing it turned out to be super profitable and did many, many private placements on it. I think I did um, somewhere about 13 or 14 private placements and everybody made multiples of their investment. And to this day, 20 years later, the checks are about to run out, 21 years later it is. Uh, but point being, uh, the opportunities are there if you realize it. Um, it's kind of like uh, marketing 101, find a problem, create a solution. And it's a serious enough problem with a good enough solution, you'll automatically make money from it because people buy solutions. I know it's a cliche. They don't buy features. They don't buy products. They buy solutions. Like uh, just thinking about uh, doing my teeth. All right. Uh, you have like uh, these electric toothbrushes. They, they found a problem that most people could not properly brush their teeth with a regular toothbrush. So they came up with the electric toothbrush and now they got ultrasound, all these things. Point is they found a problem here and they found a solution. And then the rest is history. And Kerry, one of the key things for you being finding a problem that a lot of people aren't even aware of, right? Wasn't that part of your success? Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's... <laughs> Yeah, there are those problems that uh, that you don't even know you have a problem until somebody gives you the solution, and and really uh, building on that, that's how you really uh, succeed in business. In my opinion, yeah, you could be an Uber driver, but you, if you're an Uber driver, you're solving problems too. Think about it. Someone needs to get from point A to point B. They don't want to take public transportation, or it doesn't exist, or uh, their cars in the shop, or they just don't want to drive because they're going to be drinking or whatever, uh, be out late. So they take an Uber. Uber solves problems. It's uh, but you didn't know you had the problem until Uber came up and came up with a solution. Kind of the Steve Jobs thing. No one knew they needed an iPhone until Steve Jobs created the iPhone, and then everybody wanted a smartphone. Uh, but the problem, what no one even knew, like the problems they had, whether real or imagined, until Steve Jobs uh, came across with it. So this is partly business 101, marketing 101, but it really is true that, uh, that problems equal profits. And, you know, we've done it too. Like when I first started podcasting, there were very few places to go for like real economic news. Uh, there weren't that many podcasters 10 years ago. And my goal was to just give as many sources as possible from as many different places. And I had built an audience overnight of tens of thousands of people around the world. And now there's more competition, but a large part of my audience has stuck with me. So another area like yourself, really, you wanted to, to create a show a podcast and a website where you really got down in the nitty gritty in the mining sector in a better way than virtually anybody else was doing it without the hype, without the uh, hyperbolic uh, nonsense that we see all the time, like buy this stock uh, and you know Warren Buffett will thank you, right? I mean, you never engage in that, but you found a problem, a part of the market that wasn't being served properly and you've been rewarded accordingly. 
It's really that simple in life. The more problems you solve, the more serious the problems are, the more money, the more success you're going to find. Well, well said, Kerry. Well, thank you for educating and inspiring my audience today. Kerry's website is financialsurvivalnetwork.com. His podcast, Financial Survival Network, just type it in on YouTube. If you are on YouTube or any fo- uh, podcast app, Kerry show will come up. As he said, he's been doing this for over 10 years. He was podcasting before it became popular. So, Kerry, thanks for coming on my show today. My pleasure, Bill. Anytime. Anytime. 